Okay. Welcome to Moving TV Forward in a Digital World, a conversation with Ampersand CEO, Nicole Pengas. This is part of the Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series. There we go. Today's webinar is offered in valued partnership with Tech United New Jersey. Corporate sponsors, promotional partners, and individual contributors are coming together to help our students by raising awareness and funds for the 1000 Laptop Challenge. Students and their families have experienced financial hardships as a direct result of COVID-19, and their move to a remote learning environment requires unanticipated technology investments for them, such as laptops, but you can help. When we close our webinar um, today, we'll share more information about how you can be part of this important RBS initiative. Oh, that's the one I was supposed to have on when I was talking about that. Sorry about that. I'm going to introduce Stacy in a moment, but I wanted to start out by saying a little bit about the four R's, um, our principles here at Rutgers Business School. The Rutgers Signa uh, Business School Signature Leadership Series is relatively new learning opportunity that brings you lessons of resilience, resourcefulness, responsibility, and reinvention through bi-weekly conversations with thought leaders and business leaders from across industry spectrums. We're excited to chat today with uh, Nicole Pangas of Ampersands so she can share glimpses of her everyday real life challenges as well as lessons from her leadership playbook. And here, uh, to help us get to know uh, Nicole a little bit better and facilitate dis today's discussion is our moderator, Stacy Smolin Schwartz. Stacy is a popular and award winning professor at Rutgers Business School, where she concurrently teaches and leads the new online Master of Science in Digital Marketing. She brings more than 20 years of digital marketing, marketing industry experience into the classroom, having worked for the Interactive Advertising Bureau, Virgin Mobile USA, Hospital for Special, Special Surgery, and Double Click. Stacy teaches at the undergraduate, graduate, and executive education levels on topics such as e-commerce, social media, and mobile marketing. Stacy earned her BA in advertising from Penn State University and her MBA from Harvard Business School. There, she received HBS's Service Leadership Fellowship Award and co-authored two case studies for HBS pub Publishing. And this is one of the most interesting fun facts. Stacy is also a Webby Awards judge with the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce a very valued, great colleague, Stacy Smolin Schwartz. So, Stacy, please take it from here. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and just a moment before I introduce Nicole and get started, I did just want to mention something about the um, the uh, laptop challenge, the, the fundraiser that we are doing to support students. I see firsthand, uh, particularly when we pivoted in, in the spring semester with um, our undergraduate students especially, but as well as our graduate students, that so many of them just didn't have the resources at home to be able to um, do the simple tapping into classes on a daily basis, let alone the hardware needed to take exams and, you know, do the things that they needed to accomplish. So a lot of students end up driving to you know a cousin's house once a week to try to download all their assignments and then work on it offline and go back to upload them again um, so that that um, effort really does uh, directly help students so i just want to underscore the importance of that if, if you're uh, able to participate we would encourage you to do so so moving on to today's business um, i am very pleased to introduce uh, for discussion today uh, nicole pangas as um, the CEO of Ampersand, Nicole and her team work uh, closely to build a smarter, more effective television ecosystem by empowering brands to seamlessly connect with audiences wherever and whenever we all watch TV. Nicole previously served as the global COO at Group M's M Platform, where she uh, led global product management, strategic partnerships, and technology development across the largest media investment management organization in the world. She was also a central figure in the success of pioneering programmatic advertising. At Zaxis, she first served as the global chief revenue officer and later the global COO. 
And prior to that, she was president of 24-7 Real Media, where she led the company's business in both North America and Europe. Uh, Nicole is a member of the Ad Council Board of Directors, which is where I actually started my career at the Ad Council, um, and has been named to the Ad Week 50 list. Ad Age is 40 Under 40, Crane's 40 Under 40, and Multi-Channel News Women to Watch. She was recently awarded Ad Exchanger's 2020 Leadership in Advertising Award. Nicole received her bachelor's degree in communication from Boston University, and very proudly uh, for, for us as well as Nicole, um, her MBA from Rutgers Business School. So thank you so much for joining us and your fellow alumni and students in uh, having this discussion today, Nicole. Thank you, for, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So um, I wanted to kick things off by just getting started a little bit about the context of the TV market. You know, we, we talked about ampersand moves to television forward. And in your introduction, I talked about wherever and whenever we watch. So it seems to me that um, basically traditional television watching is sort of ending on traditional TV sets and picking up on streaming on streaming platforms and Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and all of that. So um, can you spend a little bit more time talking about what you mean by moving TV forward for our digital world? Yeah, so I mean, I think you the way you described it is precisely right, which is, you know, TV isn't um, isn't dying, it's changing, right? And and the way that we're consuming media as consumers is changing, the way we are buying products is changing, right? The world is changing. Um, and the foundational reason why, why so many uh, industries are changing is very, uh, is, is really based on the same infrastructure changes, which is what was, um, you know, an analog world is becoming that of a, of a digital world. And, um, you know, and where, you know, for example, cable infrastructures where there's huge cable plans across the United States and the world, right? Um, now, uh, with digital set-top boxes and television, for example, everything's moving into the cloud, and the cloud looks a lot more like digital from where I came from than it does traditional cable advertising, right? The infrastructure is literally entirely different. The way data stored is enti is entirely different. The way shows are viewed is entirely different because you don't need, you know, you used to have to do in television, like literally there used to be a video, like a physical video that needed to be placed in a, you know, and played and then you take that out and then for an advertising you have to put that in and play the advertising and so you literally had physical assets moving back and forth as the world's becoming digital both from a television perspective and then also from obviously an advertising perspective, everything is now in the cloud. So you're moving assets in a much different way through the cloud, right? You don't need a physical tape anymore. Um, and so from a viewership perspective, also, as we all know, you might watch a streaming service and then you might go on live linear television and then you'll go back to a different streaming service and all of that wasn't available just 10 years ago, right? And so the world is changing in television advertising and what we're doing at Ampersand and really as part of the DNA of the company is bringing various players together to ensure that we are driving advertising in as effective way as possible for our brand and agency partners because brands don't only want to advertise in linear television or only want to advertise in streaming television or even in digital, you know, in digital non-television assets, they just want to reach the appropriate consumers that might be interested in their products wherever they are consuming content, right? That's from an advertiser's perspective what they want. And so what we're doing at Ampersand is really working with the traditional, um, you know, linear uh, advertising inventory of which there's actually more of that, frankly, than there is all the streaming. Interestingly enough, even though we always talk about streaming, streaming the vast majority of television content is still in traditional television the way it was but now we have to marry that to all of the streaming um, content ott linear addressable television and that's really what we're piecing together at ampersand so that from a brand perspective brands can engage with one company and then we can uh, work with them both on linear and then all of sort of the new 
you know, the new way of TV um, that we've been talking about, right? Because from a consumer perspective and from a brand perspective, it's all TV. No consumer's thinking I'm watching linear television or I'm watching a streaming service. They're just watching the content that they're interested in watching. And so really it's about piecing together this entire ecosystem as opposed to breaking it up into pieces, which, you know, from an advertising perspective uh, is some of the conversation going on right now. So do you feel like the brands are seeing it that way or just seeing it as an extension or, you know, TV advertising was a $70 billion business last year. So are they, is that at threat or in just shifting to digital or do you think that they're viewing um, digital TV viewing as an additional budget part of digital and then the traditional part might go away. How are, how are brands viewing that in terms of budgets and allocation? Brands are, brands are looking at it differently. You know, I think really the, the folks in advertising understand the criticality of linear television, traditional linear television, because again, that's really where the vast majority of inventory still sits, despite everybody thinking otherwise. It's really where the bulk of the, um, of the ability to advertise sits right now um so that's definitely you know that's definitely still happening i think what we are working very closely with brands and agencies to do is to um is to help navigate how to piece together sort of the traditional television with this sort of new world because with it comes different data that's much more census level as opposed to panel level in traditional television it's bought and and uh, and build on a panel on a very small panel um whereas in digital driven television you actually have more census level data so it looks a lot more like traditional digital advertising right and so how do you navigate these two worlds which are both very important so you don't want to ignore one or the other but you do have to figure out how to sort of stitch together a tapestry so they don't look completely disjointed right because after all they're both televisions. So you have to count for them in some way, shape, or form. It's not innate for agency or for brands to figure out how to do that. So a lot of our work um, is is that because we do have we do have 42 million households of data, which is you know the most substantial sort of census level data set uh, that exists in television. So that's a lot of the work we do, sort of navigating, educating brands to look at television a bit differently. From a $70 billion perspective that you said, you know, I think the real opportunity is television is not really the loss of the 70 billion, although of course, you know, anything's possible, but really the incremental dollars that came in to the advertising ecosystem over the last 10 or 20 years, right? Have really the incremental dollars have gone to the digital companies versus like, so the major growth has actually been on the digital side, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world. That's the world from which I came, right? I was a digital, I was, I have a very digital background. Um, the real opportunity in television is that all the dollars that moved from, from, you know, the incremental dollars that moved into digital really shouldn't have moved, like uh, digital took a bigger than fair share only because television didn't look as measurable or as targetable as what we looked like in digital. And so what we're doing at Ampersand is making it look from a data perspective, because of the data, a lot more like digital. So we can target better, we can measure better, we can find audiences with greater efficiency for brands. And that's really what digital has done for the last 20 years and why it's grown so fast. Consistent way of uh, finding audiences, potential consumers, a consistent way of targeting those consumers or potential consumers, and then a consistent way of measuring. Um, many more dollars will move into television. Incremental dollars will stay in television as a result of that kind of construct. So that's really what we're working on. I think it's, you know, nobody thinks TV is dead. I think it's about incrementality of dollars moving into the ecosystem and how we could show how powerful television is. You know, television has bigger reach than any of the, the digital platforms. But if you look at the revenue of each, you know, the digital platforms far exceed television. And that's because just it, it, the digital platforms made it a lot easier for brands and agencies to enter, you know, to transact with them much easier than television. 
So a lot of the work at Ampersand that we're doing and, and, and some others as well in the ecosystem are trying to make it much easier for brands and agencies to interact with the television world at scale, um, you know, through better data targeting and measurement. And um, you mentioned the wide reach uh, not going away. In, in recent months, it's been actually greater as we're at home more and those of us who already watched are watching a lot more. Can you give a few minutes to explain um, the impact that the you know pandemic may have had on the adver TV advertising industry? Yes, yeah, so the pan it, it's been interesting that the pandemic, so two things happened. So one is that, um, you know, everybody sort of was home and couldn't go anywhere. And so obviously TV viewership across the board in streaming services, linear, everything was up. So that was great. Um, and so, and that's continued, right? Because even though people are out a bit more than they once were, um, you know, people are mostly staying home more than they would have otherwise, right? But for what's going on um, in the world right now. So, so TV viewership, is is certainly up across the board and that's a good thing um from an advertising perspective of course the less good thing that was a bit more challenging that happened at the same time is that viewership was up but in television advertising uh sports is a huge category live sports particularly right because you can imagine that uh, big brands want to ensure that they are you know like I'm, I'm sitting in New Jersey right now, like the New York Mets, the New York Yankees, the Giants, like, all, you know, everybody wants to advertise with their local um, teams across the, the, the U.S., right? And so when sports at the time, like the Final Four was about to come, like there were things that were happening that we had um, you know, a lot of revenue against, frankly, that got canceled. These sports events got, got canceled. And from an advertising perspective, that was very challenging, right? Because live sports, poof, all of a sudden was gone. And that's a huge driver of um, brand awareness for the brands. It's important for brands to, to get their brand out through those venues. And then from an advertising perspective like ours, it's obviously a, a, an impact to our revenue. What was interesting though, is because we've pivoted into this more uh, audience driven um, world over the last couple of years in Ampersand, we were able to, to partner with our brands and agencies and say, hey, we know this tournament is canceled. However, these are the people that you were looking to target and we could find those consumers or potential consumers on all of these other places leveraging the data set that we have and it's all privacy compliant and there's nothing you know there's nothing kind of um uh from a pii perspective of you know personally identifiable information it's just consumers that look like these consumers don't you know your name don't know your address don't know any of that stuff so it's not um you know it's not a, a privacy compliance issue which comes up a lot in digital as you well know stay safe on that, on that right it's a big topic um, but we could find those audiences and so we were able to do is we weren't able to salvage a hundred percent of the money from the live sports events, but we were able to partner with our brands for them to at least deliver some message to those consumers in other places other than the live sports events. So that, that was sort of, that was sort of the counter is that there was a lot of TV viewing, which is great, but there's specific TV viewing that's of particular interest based on traditional buying methods that at the same time as there is TV viewership up, these really critical events went away at the same time. So it was an interesting, it was this interesting thing to navigate for the first kind of couple of months of, of COVID. Uh, what I find really interesting is that uh, TV is not only a really big industry, um, but it's also a very established industry. It's been around for decades. And there's so much change between, you know, even before COVID, just this digital, you know, this digital world evolving so quickly for video. And then on top of that, you have all these changes as to what kind of content people are watching and when. Um, it's a much more fragmented approach and, and you don't have the live uh, opportunities like you mentioned. Um, I'm wondering how you coming from a digital background and ampersand, you know, having um, both traditional and digital kind of roots, um, how do you approach your clients and 
do you drive them into that change or do you um, respond to their need for change? You know, how do you decide how um, aggressive you should be helping to reinvent the industry, right? Um, that, that piece. Yeah, it's, um, it's, an, it's definitely an interesting balance because in digital, where I spent you know, most of my career, um, because digital kind of came out of the ether in the 90s, right? Like there was no digital advertising business and then poof, there was the start of this digital advertising business, right? It's not the case in television to your point sort of function the same way for decades now, um, traded the same way, transacted the same way, all that sort of stuff. And it's much, much digital, different than the digital world. Um, I think that there is a acknowledgement by the vast majority, not all yet, frankly, but the vast majority, more than there was a few years ago, I'd say, um, understanding that the world of television is changing and has to change. Um, what we're doing is, um, because it's, it's difficult because, you know, you, you, you can't, because the fact of the matter is it's work, right? It's a $70 billion business. So I could poo poo as a digital person, be like, oh, this is kind of archaic. And why are you buying and selling on panel that is this small when you have so much more data? But the fact of the matter is it's functioned and it's built a $70 billion business, right? So that's great. But what we're doing is we're, we're showing our clients and our agencies side by side of, here's how you're currently transacting. Here are the audiences that you're reaching based on what you're buying. So it's not changing anything that they're doing, but what it's doing is giving them insights on places that they might um, buy more efficiently for their next campaign, for example. So it's like, I'm not gonna force you to change anything. I'm just gonna give you the data to show what audience you actually reached versus the one that you actually wanted to reach. Show things like frequency, where in some cases brands are buying high frequency, meaning they're reaching the same consumer over and over and over and over and over again. And in some cases, it might not be the consumers that they actually, that is actually their target audience. So it equates to waste, right? And so a lot we we launched a platform formally at the beginning of this year. And really the platform is meant to both drive more audience-based buys in television, which is, it looks a lot like what digital uh, platforms that I've, you know, that I've uh, worked with and run in my past life, sort of moving in, in um, to the TV ecosystem. But even just showing the side by side, so you don't actually have to buy through the system, but we could still show you insights based on traditional buys. And that's a really, that's a good way to not sort of force anybody's hand quickly, but actually just show insights to show, hey, we could be doing this better. And then you could do, you know, incremental evolution as opposed to sort of rip the bandaid off revolution, which is very, very difficult when, you know, in some cases we're talking to folks who have very successfully been in television for the last 20 or 30 years. So how do we pivot to be like, forget everything you've done for the last two or three decades, super successfully, right? And use this system instead or buy this way instead. It's, it's sort of, it would be, uh, it would be ill-advised no matter how you slice it to do it that way, right? But if you give insights and information, then we can incrementally evolve um, how TV is bought and sold, which I think is, you know, a more prudent way to to uh, to attempt something something like this. Not to say it's not difficult anyway, but I think it's a more prudent way to to approach the, um, you know, to approach the. I don't know what to say problem, but you know, the evolution of, of uh, the industry. And it seems like um, given your wide background in digital that you also um, have evolved as opposed to revolutionize, revolutionized your own career. Um, so if you could share a little bit about your own sort of leadership evolution and how you decided to go from the height of you know, cutting edge data, Zaxis, programmatic, and then deciding to not step back, but to certainly start over on a different track uh, to look at TV from its beginnings again and how it might become more digital. Yeah. Uh, well, my, my background is, um, I mean, I did, um, when I graduated from college, um, I took a job 
um, in digital advertising um, because my cousin who was in TV advertising, interestingly enough at the time said, hey, this digital advertising thing, it feels like it might be a thing. It might be something you want to try. So it's funny, this was 1999. Um, and I started in sort of um, like a part, you know, coordinator partnership role, kind of, you know, lowest level. Obviously, I was a new grad. Um, and then I moved into inside sales and then sales. When I was uh, getting my MBA at Rutgers, I went at nights and I had the bubble had burst in the digital world at that time in 2000. So shortly after I graduated college, bubble burst, survived a few layoffs, but then I decided to actually leave the industry for a few years. And I went into healthcare technology, actually, while I was at, while I was at Rutgers for my master's, I went at nights um, part time. So, um, and then when I went back into digital, it was 2005, also back into a sales role. And then I, um, I started uh, the COO at the time, sort of, uh, and I was talking to him at the company softball games and he heard that I had my MBA and he's like, why maybe we could do something with her besides sales. And so he sort of plucked me out and I did these special projects for him, like whatever he needed somebody to just run point on. So I ended up um, launching a joint venture with Dentsu, which is another really big holding company in advertising um, that is uh, based in Tokyo. And I launched a joint venture in, in, uh, in APAC. Um, and then we got bought by WPP, a company I worked for 24-7. So I led the integration of WPP. So I just ended up doing strategic projects. Um, and then fast forward about a year and I was asked to run global product management for this technology and media business. And I had no, I had no product management background whatsoever. I had never written a requirements document. So it was just because this, his, his name is John Sue, a very smart uh, guy. Not because he he um, he asked me to do this job. He just happens to be a very smart guy. Also a Harvard also a Harvard grad, grad like you, Stacy. Um, but he gave me these the tremendous opportunities that, frankly, I was punching above my weight. I think um, for a while because I was um, you know I was in my 20s at the time that he sort of pulled me out of sales and had me running these these really big initiatives for the company. Um, and uh, and it's really because of him and me running product management that I started getting this sort of wide swath of understanding of the industry and really understanding technology and data because I was forced to sit with the engineering team and learn all this stuff and learn about infrastructure and learn about how the digital business, you know, every little nook and cranny of the business. So I really owe him specifically a lot. And, you know, in addition to others that actually were patient enough with me to teach, you know, sit with me and teach me because I really didn't understand the underbelly. Um, and then I, you know, after Robert WPP, I sort of became like the tech and data girl, geek, whatever you want to call me. Um, and that's sort of how I ended up, you know, running 24 seven and then, um, you know, becoming part of Zaxxis, um, which, uh, you know, Zaxxis was, from zero dollars to a billion dollars in five years. So it's a huge success story in the digital world, you know, um, kind of one of those unicorn companies to be a part of. So that was an interesting journey. Um, and then WPP sort of pulled us up into, you know, a global organization and, um, you know, Group M, you know, the division of Group M that I was part of was like 5,000 people at the time, something like that um, across the globe. So, um, so that was really fun and um and so when you say like the path it was really accidental because exactly how i described it is how it all happened um you know i think i think you know my path had a lot to do with just you know i, I did work very hard and, and I, I i i will say like i worked harder than the people around me my whole career like i was always and that unfortunately was hours just learning and I mean, learning from people, just asking a lot of questions, but I also just read a ton. Like when I ran, when I was asked to do product management, I ran to, I remember I went home that day, I ran to Barnes and Noble and got two books just to learn what it meant to be a product manager. Cause I didn't really understand. And, um, and so, you know, I think you have to be a constant student. Number one, um, you have to ask a lot of questions. Number two, you have to be open to always, uh, doing more and and it wasn't you know what i just described to you, my path it wasn't because i was forcing myself into situations to do more it was because 
I was lucky enough that a person of influence in the company, this guy, John, that I, that I mentioned, the COO, I had just mentioned to him like, oh, I'd be really like, I'd love to do more things other than what I'm doing, but I don't, you know, know what those might look like. And so it just, he kind of filed that away. And these projects that I just mentioned and these, these jobs um, that ended up giving me a really comprehensive background in digital advertising were because he gave me the opportunity to do it. So let people know that you're open to new and different opportunities that you want to lean in that you want to, you know, broaden your spectrum, that you want to contribute more. Um, so that's sort of like my background in the digital side of sort of how I ended up kind of getting through this path. I was working hard, but frankly, like a little luck because had John not talked to me at the softball game, probably none of this, I will probably wouldn't be sitting with you right now, you know? So just being open to conversations with people that, um, of influence who could potentially help you. I don't mean from a selfish way, but just if you if you have ambition, the only way, way for people to know you have ambition is for you to tell them you have ambition, you know? I mean, and then they might think of you if there's some an opportunity, you know? Um, uh, so, so that's that. And, and moving into TV, um, so some people thought I was literally crazy when I took this job. The company was called NCC at the time, and it was really like a linear television company. Um, and so people were like, what is she doing? Like she just left kind of a big job at a big company. And like some people hadn't even heard of the company. But, but what I knew is that it was owned by three really big cable companies, right? And I knew um, in my interview process that they were combining their addressable television, which is sort of the, the digital light assets of television for these three big cable giants. We're gonna sit at what was then called NCC, but we branded rebranded now as Ampersand since I arrived and um, over the last, we rebranded about a year ago to Ampersand. Um, and they were gonna combine all their data insights. So all the data that I just mentioned of the, the, the 42 million households, the data insights were going to be combined in ampersand and that started to make this television company look a lot like what i was familiar with on the digital side right and so i said i know what we could do with all of that like i i it was very clear to me how the pieces could be put together to to push this company into being at the forefront of advanced television you know data driven television um to look a lot like the digital giants but actually with better assets right because television assets are actually much more valuable um and much more high quality right like high quality production level content in television is much better than the banner ads you see on you know as you're surfing the web and so you sort of combined all these great assets um and so that's why i jumped over is because i just saw the possibility i saw the possibility and i was willing to just take the you know the risk so to speak on on seeing if we could if we could make it happen and so it's been two you know over two years now um since i moved sort of from digital to television and it's been it's been an amazing journey you know it's been interesting because there's definitely a, there's a different um there's a different understanding of the digital world in traditional television, right? And same with me, I have a very digital background. And so I'm being educated on traditional television by my team and by our partners. And, you know, I'm sort of the digital girl coming in saying, well, that's not really how it works on the digital side. And so it's sort of a, it's like a mind meld, I think a little bit. What's happening right now is people like me are moving into television and the television, traditional television people are learning a lot more about the digital side. And eventually these things will, you know, start coming together more, more, um, you know, more organically, I think. Listening to your story, I feel like you're a walking uh, poster for um, the, the tenants of the records brand as far as your reinvention of your career path your resiliency, your resourcefulness. Um, yes, you had a mentor who helped you, but you showed up to that softball game and, and you, um, you know, put yourself out there and got to know people and, and, and made sure people knew who you were and the things you were interested in. And, um, you know, being able to have that intuition, I think, is um, a really important part of the evolution as opposed to revolution of your industry and, and your, your leadership path as well. 
Um, I do have a related question from our audience um, with specific to regards to um, the sort of more recent part of your leadership journey in terms of um, getting to the CEO level. So um, this specific question asks about, um, as a female, do you think that there was any um, thing that um, it specifically says, what are, what are some of the sacrifices you had to make to get to the CEO level? So do you think that was different for you in media and marketing and television, or do you feel like um, gender doesn't play as much a role in, in this industry? No, it definitely does. As much as, you know, I think people, um, I think, you know, in, in media and specifically in digital media, it's sort of like, you know, considered hip and you get to wear jeans to work and you're Chuck Taylors or whatever, you know, so it's not, so I think that there's this, um, this feeling like there isn't, you know, any sort of discrimination, you know, gender discrimination, racial discrimination, all the things we know about, but there really is, you know, there is. Um, so it's, it's interesting because as much as I had male, and it was in my case, I actually had mostly male mentors and supporters who helped me where I, you know, helped me get to where I am today. Um, Interestingly enough, like the same balance, you know, the same people that supported me still had um, really like thoughts based on my gender. For example, when I was pregnant with my first daughter, I was I was an executive in the company um, at the time. And when I told my colleagues and I waited, I waited a long time to tell them I was pregnant. and I was sort of hiding it and all that sort of stuff. So I didn't say I, I think I was like. 22 weeks or something, you know, like more than halfway through the pregnancy before I told people. Um, and somebody said, and this is somebody that I, you know, supported me and I was friendly with, and they're like, oh, this, like, this, congratulations, but the, you know, this is our worst nightmare come true. And he didn't mean it. It's, this sounds, I'm sharing it because I think these insights are important. He didn't mean it in a way to make me feel bad, but you can imagine. I thought to myself, okay, I was the only female executive on a team of all male. I was the only female on the executive team. So now I know as a female who I know that they liked me, like we got along and I was kind of, you know, like they, it, but they had discussed because I had been married at the time for a few years, like, oh, do you think, do you think Nicole is going to have a baby soon? And do you, what, like, do you think she's going to, what, how, now, meanwhile, I had called male colleagues at basically the same age, basically married the same amount of years. And guess who wasn't like, guess who wasn't worried about whether or not they were about to have a baby too, because they were, they were all having babies at the same time. But I was the executive spoken about on what would happen if I have a child. So right there is gender discrimination because my male colleagues' wives were pregnant, but that wasn't a topic of discussion. It was simply because I was a female, right? um and and so there is discrimination unfortunately that happens i was also told things like um you know i wasn't uh you know i had asked for a specific role um uh, promotion at, at when i was at wpp and i was told um well you know you're really more like a coo like we, like we don't see you as like a front like a, a ceo person and based on nothing, right? Because my whole career has been in front of clients. You know, I was, I flew around the world to close business for my whole career. And so, you know, discrimination happens even as you're growing up. And, and what I did, frankly, and I'm, you know, I'll publicly say this, I ended up resigning from WPP because I realized that the roles that I aspired to get, I would not get there. I was going to get senior level roles, C level executive, and actually I turned down a CEO role there, but it wasn't a CEO role that I wanted. It was it was sort of not right for me. And so I had I literally I resigned with no job. Um, I I resigned with no job. I turned down a promotion. I resigned with no job, and I took some time off because I realized that there was this perception of me because of the way I look. Um, you know, I was a young female. You see the way I look like, you know, I have a braid and I don't wear makeup a lot. And, you know, and so I didn't fit the mold. I didn't fit the mold. 
Um, and I just said, you know, I'm going to just go off and I know what I, you know, I, I believed in what I was capable of doing. And sometimes you just have to, you know, you have to just believe in yourself, even if others don't think you're capable of doing certain things, you know? And so, and it's not, again, it's not because they didn't think I was capable. It's that they wanted me to do certain things specifically. And so very often people will put you in a box in your career, specifically if you are a woman or a minority, you will be put in a box, unfortunately, perceived as a certain thing um, because you don't fit the perception of the mold, right? Because I do not look like a CEO of a $2 billion business, but guess what I am, right? But you, you kind of, I don't want to say you need people like me, but like now people see that somebody like me can be a CEO of a $2 billion business. And so that leads the path for other people that don't look the part to do it. So there is discrimination. You just have to be vocal about it. Like people like me need to, to share these stories of things that have happened so people are aware of it. Um, and I don't mean to like speak negatively about people, but like these things happen and we have to talk, not, not to disparage other people, but just to share what actually happens, right? Women are told to be appreciative when they reach this C-suite as opposed to men who are told they earned it. These things happen all the time. I was told constantly how appreciative I should be to be in the C-suite. I'd never heard male colleagues told that. I've, I've been told how amazing they were and how blah, 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 blah. And so just the, the way that people are described is just so different. And, you know, like all of these descriptors matter, you know, they matter in how people are perceived. So, so it, there is definitely, there are definitely challenges getting to the C level and certainly it being a CEO um, as a female, but I, I don't even think it's a female. I think any, anybody who is sort of doesn't, doesn't look the part. So that's based on, you know, race, gender, um, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it is, it is not equal yet, but, you know, people have to keep pushing and taking a stand and hopefully it'll become more equal over time. Thank you for sharing that. That's um, really uh, meaningful and, and I appreciate your candor. Um, there's a related question uh, related to ampersand. So um, do you have a mentorship program or do you informally ensure that um, your employees are being seen where they need to be? Yeah, we do have um, we do have a mentorship um, program um, at Ampersand. We we um, we do a bunch of different things. So I think you know there's sort of the formal mentorship program. But one of the things that I'm a big believer in is is um, is accessibility. So there's formal mentorship, but also I think from a business perspective, accessibility is very important. And what I mean by that is. Um, you know, there are folks who are men and women who I worked with 10 years ago at WPP or 24 seven, you know, 24 seven before I recovered with WPP. And just, you know, people still ping me and I still ping people who I just trust their judgment on something. So I think there's this notion of formal mentoring, which is important and you do. But what I would say is, um, I value the informal mentoring much more than formal mentoring. So this notion of like, we're going to have a mentorship program and it's going to be an hour a month and you're going to report back. That to me, frankly, has always sort of proved to be, you know, with low to moderate results on like actual real life practicality. But what I do do and what I always have done and I, and I you know, my team uh, at Ampersand certainly does it. It's sort of like open door policy. So when I got to Ampersand two years ago, it's like anybody at any level can email me or pop in my office in your New York and give me any feedback, ask me a question, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I've sort of done that through my whole career, um, just been accessible. And, you know, so I, I get texts from people who I worked with 10 years ago or, or more who were just out of college, it was their first job, and now they're married with like three kids. Um, you know, getting into the senior level and they're, they're texting me just to hop on the phone to help guide them through a conversation on what they should ask for from a compensation perspective because they don't feel like they're sort of, um, you know, 
they're being treated fairly financially or something like that, right? And so that's a form of like informal mentorship. Um, and that's really relationships, right? Like relationships matter. So find people, my advice would be not to not pay attention to mentorship programs, but really find the people throughout your life and throughout your, your career who you feel comfortable with them being a sounding board for you. And, and if those people are accessible to you at the times that you really need them, which are probably not like on, you know, every other Tuesday at four, you know, it's probably not that it's something happened. There's an acute issue that you want guidance on and find the people that will help you through those times. Those are the things that I think will really move the needle in your career. Um, and, and so that would be my, my guidance on, on, on sort of the mentorship factor, just find people you trust. And, and, um, if they're willing to give you time and most people are like, if you reach out and say, I have an issue, I, people sometimes reach out to me and just say, Hey, I'm friends with so and so. They recommended I reach out to you because I'm do I'm dealing with something at work and they thought that you could have some advice for me. Like those things, like I would oh I would take those, I take those calls every every time they come to me because if somebody has an acute situation like that, we've all been there in our career. And so you know that you just need an ear of somebody who is separated from the situation that can guide you, you know, and, and that that is a a different form of mentorship that I think is as or more powerful than some of these formal mentorship programs that we so we sort of do through our careers. Thank you for that. Um, we have a couple of questions related back to the video um, advertising industry. And um, the first one of which is, uh, when do you think the agencies will finally break down the walls between their digital and linear teams and take advantage of the it's all video philosophy and approach? Ah, I wish I had the answer to that question. Um, I don't know. It will happen. It will happen. I think, um, and it's starting to, and I will say it's starting to happen because in order for the break down the walls to happen, you need some of the stuff that we've been talking about, which is the only way to really break down the walls is to have both groups transact more similarly. And the fact of the matter is the buying of television is quite substantially different from the buying of, of digital. Digital is done through interfaces, it's transacted more in real time, television's done through, you know, in the US, Nielsen panel data, uh, a lot of it's done upfront, although with COVID, you know, the upfronts were canceled. And so there's a lot more going into, you know, more, um, you know, less upfront, more um, sort of as, as clients need it. So I think that interestingly enough, as awful as this situation has been in the world, and it is, the benefit of what's happening, not just in advertising, but if you just look across sort of like supply chain, this is creating a forcing function in almost every industry to drive what would have been a five to 10 year transition into a much shorter period of time. You already see that happening, right? And so things like there's a lot of discussion about um, advertisers and agencies not conforming to the upfronts as aggressively because now that the pandemic hit, what brand would, would uh, commit to dollars and rates understanding that the world could you know go topsy-turvy the way it did this year right never accounted for it so i think there's a lot that will change i don't think it's going to be this year but i do see more and more the tv teams and the digital teams working more closely because as more you know companies like ours create platforms with interfaces to transact on you start bringing these two teams a lot closer, right? Because the TV teams, you know, we're 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 going to be, you know, rolling out our our platform to the buy side. As TV teams start actually using interfaces to transact, then it starts looking a lot closer to the digital side, and that's when you start bringing it together. But you really need them functionally, operationally, to work more similarly than they have traditionally, and that's really why the wall, you know, why the wall has been up. So. 
you know, I think I think probably you know a couple of years yet if we're going to be honest about it. Um, but I but I think it's going to happen. Also, the agencies are quite strained, you know, financially. So it's, that also creates a forcing function to create efficient efficiencies in the business. So you know, you have the systems part, but then you actually have like the the real business part, which is the agency model as it traditionally has has been run is 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 quite strained as we've seen you know every every major agency has done significant layoffs um you know even before covid but certainly um exacerbated by by the pandemic thank you uh, we have several questions related to the same theme uh with regards to conversion and metrics of television advertising and attribution and I guess I'm wondering, <clears throat> uh, traditionally with linear television, uh, I guess TV was expected to perform a certain way and it was held to that accountability in a certain way. And has that changed now that there's this collision with digital and things are so much more measurable? Um, and will that change the rest of TV? Yeah, I think what's happening actually is as this data that's much more um, accurate, frankly, is is coming into TV. What we're able to show, and it's a lot of the work that we're we're doing um, at Ampersand, and certainly others are, are as well, is we're showing the power of television and how actually it's it's television driving the digital transactions. Historically, digital was taking, you know, and I was one of these people where I go to a brand and say, hey, look how many transactions we're driving for you. But what we were missing is the whole top of the funnel where it was actually the television ad that drove an individual to the digital website to drive the transaction. But historically, television hasn't had that data to show that. But now, for example, we can show a television ad. We know exactly where it ran and exactly on what networks it ran on. And we can show within that same um, area or household cluster if people went to the website of that advertiser within a window of X time, right? And so you could show within a half hour of the ad, this is what happened and here's the funnel. Within an hour, within a day, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is the funnel that traditionally has only existed in, in digital and now it actually exists in television. So it looks like a lot more of what digital looked like. Now that being said, I don't think television, so so TV we can show attribution much more than we have historically. That being said, the world of advertising should not be um, you know immediate response only, meaning you can't make television a performance business where the only way that it's valuable is if somebody goes to a website and clicks. The reason why is if somebody sees a Mercedes ad, for example, right? One, uh, Erwin Gottlieb, who was the CEO of Group M and then chairman, he had a great analogy, which is you don't wake up in your 50s or your 60s uh, wanting to buy a Mercedes Benz out of the blue. It's not, and it's not because you saw the ad in your 50s or 60s. The reason you want to buy your Mercedes in your 50s or 60s is that you saw an ad for Mercedes when you were 10 and you saw how luxurious it was. Then you saw it again when you were 15, when you were like had your job after school, and then maybe in college, and then maybe in grad school, and you really want one, but you can't afford one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's like, there's a life cycle of consumers for certain brands that literally span decades. So it's not, it can't just be a performance business. The power of television actually lies in these other things in building brands. Like it's the power of building brands that is not just about the click or the conversion, although it is eventually, right? You want some action, but it's also just brand awareness, brand allure, right? It's it's actually creating the, the, the notion of a luxury brand. You have to get it out in a certain way over a long period of time, right? So it's happening, but we don't wanna race to the bottom where TV advertising is only valued on a click. Right, because that that's a race to the bottom. That that doesn't help. Um, it doesn't help the consumer experience. It doesn't help the brands. Um, that would be sort of bad for the ecosystem in general, consumers included. Okay, so um, one final question before we sign off, as we near the top of the hour. Um, 
the uh, power of video is speaking for itself here with the questions. And we have a question about the medals behind you on the wall. Would you mind sharing with us what those medals are for? <laughs> Um, I, I swear I didn't put these up because I'm, work, I'm working from, this is my attic, um, and this has been the setup in my attic from before COVID. It's the only place I can work in my house. I don't have an extra bedroom. Uh, so I am, um, well, I haven't, I, I haven't run a race uh, in a little while, but I, uh, for, I guess, three or four years, I, um, I went from not running at all to being a very avid distance runner. And so I, I ran something like, I think 15 or 16 half marathons and two marathons between 2014, 15, and last year. So those are so those are my um, those are my medals for my for my run. Congratulations, Bye. well earned. I'm yeah. glad they're getting some airtime that they deserve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I almost if I was if I was less lazy, I would have taken it out from the wall so you can't see it or something. But it's the only. This is the only place I could put my desk, and that's sort of my workout area back there, which is the only place I can have it in my attic. So, and you have a window in your attic, which is uh, priceless. Yes, thankfully I do. Yes, no air conditioning, but a window. All right. Well, thank you, Sven, for spending so much time with us this this uh, afternoon, Nicole. I, I feel like this conversation really uh, helped us get to know you and and ampersand, and also really um, helped exemplify the the resiliency, the resourcefulness, the um, reinvention of yourself and the responsibility that, that Rutgers really uh, tries to, um, you know, provide its, its students and also uh, adapt to our changing world. So I really uh, appreciate your being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I want to jump in and express my thanks on behalf of uh, Rutgers Business School and the Lifelong Learning Team. Um, we especially love that um, you tell people that they should be a constant student, um, and, that, and that was great. And um, Stacy, gosh, thank you so much um, for being a fantastic uh, moderator. That was certainly an inspired discussion, and I loved how we closed it out about um, you know, all the, the medals um, that you've earned in, in your personal life um, and also showing how integrated our work and personal lives are these days. Um, but I'd like to also thank our audience. Um, they sent in great questions that were um, certainly thoughtful and enhanced our dialogue. Um, I wanted to return to something I mentioned um, earlier. Um, it's in my, come on, there we go. Um, uh, our our 1000 laptop challenge. Um, this is a fairly new component of our signature leadership series and it's around our students and their families who've endured financial hardship since you know COVID-19 has really rocked all of our worlds but they quickly entered a remote learning environment that required technology such as laptops that many simply can't afford. Corporate sponsors, promotional partners, and individual contributors can help by donating to our 1000 Laptop Challenge Fund. You'll receive an email with more information about how you can be part of this important initiative and a link to the donation webpage. And we appreciate any generous support that you can provide. Oh, wow, my buttons aren't working so well today. <laughs> there we go. Um, just a reminder to everyone who's listening that our RBS Signature Leadership Series takes place bi-weekly on Thursdays at noon Eastern, and we have an exciting schedule of business leaders lined up to sit down with us over the next several months. For more information, you can always visit our webpage. It's long, I'm gonna say it anyway, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. Um, but since it is long, um, here's information about our uh, very next um, one, which is Joe Cinziano of Samsung Electronics, America's consumer electronics business, and he's coming up uh, next. So um, for the rest of you, uh, we want this series to continue to meet your needs, so please stay on the line briefly um, as the webinar ends because you'll immediately see a two-question survey about today's event. 
And finally, as I mentioned when our webinar began, a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and emailed uh, to anyone who registered. It will also be on the Business Insights page of our website. So Nicole, Stacy, and a fantastic audience, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you.